Batman. He is probably my favourite comic book hero ever, even more so than any other fictional character I've ever known. Right from the get-go, something that has always intrigued me about Batman is the psychology behind the character. Even when I was a kid, his no-killing rule, the trauma that made him into what he would become, the whole symbolism of taking that element of fear for him and controlling it, it all just felt different to me. Batman isn't the generic, quippy, hopeful superhero. He's different. He's tragic. He has no defining superpowers that separate him from the regular person, and by default that completely separates him from almost every other superhero. That's what intrigues me. The fact that there is nothing special about Bruce Wayne. He wasn't bitten by a radioactive spider, he wasn't sent to Earth in refuge from another planet, he's just a human. A really, really wealthy human. Jokes aside, the back alley mugging that changed his life forever could have happened to anyone. In fact, just looking at his origins alone, Bruce has the makings of a tragic villain. So after all of this, when he doesn't become the villain, that's what interests me. And the lingering question at the back of my mind is, how? How could you go through all of that and choose to be good? Well, that's exactly it. One of the most compelling themes that I can associate with Batman is choice. Fundamentally, Batman is about choice. He is always forced into moral ultimatums because they serve as a true test of his greatest enemy, his own ideology. He is as much a psychological hero as he is a physical one, and consequently the very best of his stories always break down the philosophy behind the character. All of this is just so interesting for me, but I wanted to learn more. So I read some comics, watched some documentaries, read some books, and my journey to really delve into the psychology of Batman took an amazing impact when I got to the films. So throughout my journey, this is what I learned. Let's look at the Dark Knight trilogy. Each film deconstructs Batman's psychosis differently. It asks the question, what is Batman? The first film approaches him as an object of fear, perfectly matching him against Scarecrow. The second film explores the crime vacuum his cause, the consequent anarchy and chaos pitting him against the Joker. And the third film delves into the fallout of Batman's career, the physical, symbolic and emotional trauma as a result of being Batman, poetically positioning him to oppose Bane. You can argue that the Dark Knight is the best in the trilogy, you can argue that Batman Begins or the Dark Knight Rises are the best, but the truth is that each entry to the series is perfect in its own right. They're perfect in telling their respective stories and introducing us, the audience, to the varying aspects of Batman. Batman Begins is the perfect origin for Batman because it sets him down the path of controlling fear. The Dark Knight is the perfect sequel because it explores the chaotic and tragic toll of his career. The Dark Knight Rises is the perfect end because it follows the journey of how that man who initially fell down that hole, that life of misery, self-destruction and pity, all in a quest for revenge. The Dark Knight Rises sees that man finally escape that pit. It sees that man finally see the wisdom in not conquering fear, but welcoming it. Don't be afraid. Embracing it, allowing it to strengthen that man and accept the toll. The journey Bruce takes throughout the films show him that he's a man, not an island. This revenge quest is destructive to him and those around him. In The Dark Knight Rises, Bruce doesn't fear death. He welcomes failure because he has nothing left. Bruce left his life as Batman, but never moved on. He was waiting for the next thing to go bad, but eight years passed and he never got out of that pit. And to escape that pit, Bruce must revisit the fear that conditioned him all his life and instead embrace it. Bruce must be faced with the beginning of his journey so he can be reborn to face the end of it from this Lazarus pit. It's in this moment when he finally realises his journey. Everything he's been building up to since he was a kid was to conquer that fear that made him weak. He wanted to control it and weaponize it, however now he knows that death isn't, or rather shouldn't be part of his journey if it meant pity and failure. Death is something impactful, it means seeing that evil triumph, it's something to be feared. Bruce once again finds that fear and embraces it. He makes that jump, that leap of faith into fear, into the unknown, knowing that his death would surely await him should he fail. But it's that strength, that persistence that he can't afford to fail that finally allows him to break free of the tragic bonds that made him Batman, the symbol of fear, and helped him escape that pit. He was now Batman, the symbol of hope, and now his death meant something. He wasn't a criminal or a vigilante, he was made a martyr. 
So what can we learn from this entire trilogy? Bruce faced off with his own fear, chaos and pain, and at the heart of it all, trauma, and he came out on top. All because he had the choice to be better. To accept the two halves of his life that were at constant conflict and know that they didn't have to isolate him on two fronts. So now, let's look at the very unique Batman Forever. This film asks the question, who is Batman? Both literally and figuratively, but it's deeper than that. It's not asking who the man behind the mask is, nor is it necessarily asking what the persona of Batman means. Instead, it's deconstructing the psychology of the Batman. And it does this using every main character in the film, so let's start with Robin. Like Bruce, Dick Grayson witnesses his family being murdered firsthand. Dick endures the same trauma that conditioned Bruce to make that candlelight pledge and vow revenge on the scum of Gotham. Bruce, however, made the choice to value the memory of his parents from the trauma of a child. He made the vow to make sure that no one would ever go through what he did. But Dick is forced into a blind hatred toward Two-Face. Two-Face, of course, being the product of Batman's very existence. This movie proves that Batman is a self-sustaining answer to crime. He stops it, but at the cost of gaslighting it. And this is the perfect setup for Robin in this context, as it gives him a reason to target the bad guy while following a dark path. This is developed more so in the deleted scenes when Bruce tells Dick, I don't know you, but I'm like you. And Dick simply dismisses him and says, Two-Face is my future. Creating a parallel between how Batman initially began with revenge in mind and through a journey of self-discovery allowed him to control his emotions. This seemingly destructive attitude sets the stage for his spiral of revenge beautifully and positions him to learn what it means to forgive and channel anger productively. Dick can't even value himself because he couldn't save his family. Alfred ensures him that for no matter what circumstances may have occurred, Broken wings mend in time. One day Robin will fly again. One day Robin will fly again. One day he will make that choice to honour his family's legacy on the forefront of fighting the people who took them from him alongside Batman in the name of justice. Dick Grayson's whole motif in this story is being a vulnerable adolescent manipulated by his desire for revenge, just as Bruce was. His ultimate choice that he wouldn't kill Two-Face reflects Bruce's guidance and shows that Bruce's nature of justice finally resonates with him. He's made that choice to not be consumed by his own rage, but to channel it into ensuring that no one else had to have that bad day. And of course, if we're going to talk about a psychologically challenging Batman film, then we got to talk about the crazed narcissist himself, the Riddler. Edward Nigma is somewhat of a stalker to Bruce Wayne. He's obsessed with his mind and idolizes him to the point of eventually wanting to best him. There's a book called Batman and Psychology in which it briefly covers this version of Riddler, quote, categorizing people in positive and negative extremes, switching abruptly between idolizing and demonizing the same individual as indicated by his vacillating views toward Bruce Wayne. And what really sends this home is how he is genuinely disgusted and deplored by Bruce Wayne's initiative to reject his proposal on the threat that it poses to innocence. You were supposed to understand. I'll make you understand. This obsession is further reflected in how he's intrigued by the greatest riddle of all. Who is Batman? Riddler doesn't have a genuine motive to destroy Batman until he uncovers his secret identity as Bruce Wayne. The two idols he's come to demonize, one for spite, the other for intrigue, have culminated to be one in the same. Through his efforts to destroy Batman and Bruce Wayne, he manages to inadvertently unite Batman and Robin. His entire motivation serves as a double meaning because although he claims that he wants to be the smartest, <laughs> sorry, cleverest in Gotham, he just wants to be better than Bruce Wayne. And by the end of the film, he's clearly developed a god complex and believes that he has truly bested the two great influences in his life, Bruce Wayne and Batman, and even to the extent of mocking him. Riddle me this, riddle me that. Who's afraid of the big black and it is so satisfying to see Batman as that symbol of fear to the Riddler when he is finally beaten. Something that is often overlooked in this film is Batman himself. Out of all the Burton Schumacher films, none other shows Bruce Wayne as often, nor depicts him so thoroughly as a meaningful character. More explicitly, the treatment of Batman in relation to Bruce Wayne. It's similar to how Batman is treated in the Dark Knight trilogy. Batman is a curse to Bruce Wayne, it's an obsession that he can't afford to give up, and an obsession that destroys him as a person. Bruce acknowledges this and desperately doesn't want Dick Grayson to be any part of it. Bruce sees himself in Dick Grayson. And I really could have worded that better. 
I find it interesting how Chase Meridian was not only a love interest to Bruce, but someone who can guide him to accepting the two halves of his life that are at constant conflict, to which he, in turn, can reciprocate unto Grayson. There's a line that's often ridiculed. I don't blend in at a family picnic. And it's trashed because of how absurd it is. But it's, its absurdity is exactly the reason why it's said. What he's saying is that no matter who he is underneath, Batman will forever make an unsuitable environment for those closest to him. A life filled with danger. A life that Meridian has seemingly developed a lust for. And it's in Batman's mystique compared to Bruce's compassion and emotional isolation that Meridian finds where her heart truly lies. Bruce is burdened by Batman throughout the film, depicted through the emotional toll of taking on the weight and responsibility of the deaths of the Flying Grayson going as far as subconsciously admitting I killed them What did you say? He killed them Two-Face He slaughtered that boy's parents No No, you said I I killed him Batman is not the answer to giving Bruce purpose. It's not rehabilitation, it's not even means to an end, it's simply consuming him on all fronts. Bruce's father's diary serves as a bleak reminder to him that there would never be another entry in it ever again, and how it parallels with Bruce never being the same person again, as from that day forth he would become something else entirely. He would become the Batman. Meridian notices this with Bruce, saying, I think you understand obsession better than you let on. The duality Bruce faces also reflects the villains. How Nygma is obsessed with puzzling Bruce and understanding his psyche, not unlike Meridian's fascination with Batman. And how Two-Face is obsessed with allowing chance to dictate his actions. He initially takes the Dreamcatcher Meridian offers him in the hopes that it might give him clarity and somehow emotionally unbind him from the burden of being Batman. However, in the end, he ultimately returns it when he understands that he doesn't need it anymore. This is displayed at the end, through his actions as a mentor to Dick Grayson and patient to Meridian in realizing that he and the Batman can coexist. Not because I have to be. Now because I choose to be. He only wins because he is the only one to understand that he is not bound by obsession any longer, but can instead afford to have the one thing his enemies lack choice. What's even sad to see about this film is that much of that development of Bruce's internal struggle with duality is explored only in the deleted scenes, such as when Bruce is faced with a giant, monstrous bat in the depths of the Batcave, mirroring the darkness of depths in his own psyche. The symbol of his own fear and trauma confronts him while he stands there unflinchingly, welcoming it, welcoming his fear and embracing his identity as Batman. At the core of this film is the motif of choice, Bruce's choice to lead two lives out of his desire to inspire hope rather than obligation to avenge his parents. Bruce's realization that despite his teachings, Robin must choose for himself what he will do. A man has to go his own way. This film is about choice. It's about Bruce's release from his guilt and sense of burden to serve Gotham as his protector, and instead choose to be Batman forever. That's how it starts. The fever, the rage, the feeling of powerlessness that turns good men cruel. People hate what they don't understand. Is there a sense to be made in a random street killing, leaving a boy orphaned and traumatised for life? What about when man is first destructively introduced to the seemingly all-powerful god that is Superman? Batman v Superman asks the question, why is Batman? Batman v Superman is ultimately a sequel to Man of Steel. It's a continuation of Clark's uprising to heroism and is the next logical step in his journey. Why? Because it deals with the fallout of his first exposure to the people of Earth. They now know that an all-powerful god lives among them and it prompts the question of the morality of his actions. People fear how he can distinguish between what lives are worth saving and what lives are expendable. This passage from a YouTube comment says it all. It is over the next 18 months that Bruce's wound festers. For the first time in his entire life, that first criminal has a name. Superman. He had long ago vowed to make sure that what happened to him never happened to anyone else ever again. And now, he had failed. That little girl had been powerless to stop her mother from dying. Young Bruce had been powerless to stop his. And what drives Bruce further insane is that he is powerless against that first criminal all over again. Next to Superman, Bruce is merely the defenseless child he is in his memory. All his years of training and fighting amounts to nothing against the Man of Steel. 
Bruce Wayne, an already psychologically damaged individual, is driven mad by this. To compensate for the imbalance of power, he starts torturing criminals. He brands them, he kills them, and for two years, Batman is evil. Batman is the villain. The ambiguity of Superman's powers and the looming threat of his potential to use it for evil festers like a plague in the people. And among these people are Bruce Wayne and Lex Luthor, both of which have their actions dictated completely by this fear. In this story, Batman is as much an antagonist as Lex Luthor. Both of them depend upon forging a silver bullet to ensure their survival. This sense of misunderstanding gnaws away at the both of them, channeling into hate, pitting them against the man cursed with power only wanting to help the people and act as a force for good. The beautiful lie is Bruce's salvation from his trauma through Batman. Only in his dream could it rehabilitate him and take him toward the light, but in reality it forced him into a deeper darkness. One that would consume him forever. In this film, everything about Batman screams villainy, and it's because we're so familiar with him being the hero that we know he's different. He's conflicted, he's uncharacteristic, he's scared of Superman. He's scared of that 1% chance that Superman couldn't be all good. His nightmare proves this. He has a vision of a future where Superman was bad and he was an unstoppable force. He had an army behind him. He chained people up like pigs for the slaughter and hunted down any threat to his power. This is what scared Bruce because this was a reality that was yet to happen. Bruce is introduced to us on screen like a horror movie villain. He's brutalizing and branding thugs in a way that condemns them to their fate. He dismisses the morality of his actions because he's always always been a criminal. He's angry and he's hunting and so falls the house of Wayne exactly as it began all those centuries ago. This hatred building in Bruce like an intense hellfire is destroying him. When Bruce finally decides that he's going to kill Superman, he has another nightmare, except this time he sees his mother's grave bleeding. He's desecrating her memory and he's lost sight of his own legacy, all in his own fear and hatred. He's about to condemn a scared, isolated orphan to death because he fears him, and then BAM, a giant bat monster busts out of the grave to attack Bruce but it's deeper than that. This is what Batman is seen as. It's that monstrous, inhumane element of fear that he appears as to his enemies and he no longer sees himself as the man behind the mask. What this symbolizes is that if Bruce commits to this path of hatred, if he kills Superman, then he will go down into that place that he'll never get out of. The haunting image of the bat and the darkness within him will consume him and he'll no longer be a man, but instead a ruthless murderer driven by fear and hatred. Alfred makes a note that Bruce interrogates six people as Batman before he tried his efforts as Bruce Wayne and only then did he get what he was after. Bruce is more Batman than he is Wayne. He's outlived his father and he doesn't know where to go. All that Bruce has and all that he knows is Batman. He's haunted by the ghosts of his past and has all but abandoned the humanity within him. There's a distinct scream effect that plays every single time Batman is brought up to Bruce. Whether it's the fallout of his actions, the threatening presence of Gotham or the aftermath of Superman's actions, Bruce hears hears this scream echo through him like a constant reminder of the tragedy that is his life. His suspicions are all but confirmed to him by Flash's encounter in the Batcave telling him that he was right all along setting Bruce on that path to unite the Justice League just as Barry told him. Alfred is disgusted with Bruce taking the kryptonite and instead of destroying it, he weaponizes it. He's no better than Lex and his only argument is the simple question, how many good people are left? How many stay that way? While Superman saves people, Batman brutalizes them. While Superman's theme is hopeful and melancholy, Batman's is sinister and tragic. This hatred has all but consumed him and set him down the path to murder someone who is only guilty of being the only one trying to do the right thing. It's only when Superman calls out Martha's name does Bruce realize the toll of his journey. He's lost sight of his purpose. He's finally seen that this man that is feared and despised and condemned to death is just a man. He has a mother that he too loves. Bruce finally gets his chance to make amends and promise that Martha would not die that night. He gets his chance to use all that he's built towards to finally realize his purpose. For the first time ever, Batman can undo what was done to him. He can stop the man who killed his parents. Not by stopping Superman, not by stopping a criminal, but by stopping himself. He learns to open his heart and step out of the darkness and toward the light. Batman is no longer a symbol of fear for him, but a symbol of hope. The two sides of Bruce's life are no longer at conflict. He learns that he can be both. He has the choice to lead both lives in harmony rather than letting one consume him in agony. That is the why. 
Bruce lost sight of why Batman existed and used it only as a punishment, as an expression of violence and encompassing persona of personal rage, fear, and hatred. Through a brilliant battle of morality by showcasing a very human response to a god, Batman v Superman explores why Batman exists. So why would someone who has endured so much pain, trauma, and insanity continue to do what he does? Why would a man condemn himself to live with both sides of these lives? And why does it endear us so much? Honestly, I can't tell you. The psychology behind Batman continually impresses me and intrigues me in a way that very few other characters do. Batman is the darkest pit anyone could fall to before becoming anything less than a hero, and I think that's why I love it so much. The character has every chance to fall victim to the insanity he battles, but he doesn't. He's already had his bad day, and in a way, it cursed him to a fate worse than even the Joker's. It's why he can't be happy. It's why his life as Bruce Wayne will always be haunted by his life as Batman. It's why even in retirement, he's called to action. It's why when he has glimpses of happiness, they're taken away from him. It's why when he finally accepts his fate, it's frightening. He walks the edge of the abyss. One bad day is all it took to get him there. One bad day enough to drive a man to lunacy. As much as I say he chooses to be Batman, it's really Batman chooses him. He's cursed with this dark and painful life, but he endures it so no one else has to. He chooses to be Batman so that no one else has to. 